um, we probably will be working toward developing some urban agricultural models. And I think there's sort of a line dividing it, but it's probably a hazy kind of blurry line. But for most communities, I think of community gardens as smaller scale, scale gardens that residents cultivate themselves primarily uh, to use the produce themselves or give it to neighbors or possibly some small sales. Whereas in agriculture, most people see that as a larger commercial venture uh, where uh, sales are the primary goal of the agricultural product um, process. So uh, we are going to be talking primarily about community gardens. Um, and I am having trouble. Okay, so here we are. And our tool is available online, www.nplayonline.org. And the policy package, this is the cover page, Establishing Land Use Protections for Community Gardens. And uh, before we turn to the tools, I just want to let you know that we also have a fact sheet, which is a brief two-page document that uh, kind of summarizes what these tools do. They're helpful. At, this fact sheet's helpful as an overview and also may help you convince your local policymakers um, to move forward with these tools. First, one suggestion is not at all. And this is a little bit my excuse to show cute dog pictures. And the one on the left is my dog. Charlie, and the one on the right is his very good friend, Oliver, and as you can see, they are two very different sized dogs, but there actually is a point other than showing cute dogs, and that is that at NPLAN, we recognize there's great variety across the country of our local communities. There are different state laws that regulate them, and there are different needs and different uh, concerns in different communities. When we design our local policy tools, we really see them as a template, as a guide for what a local community can do. And we suggest language and we suggest policies, but ultimately, each community can take it and tailor it to their own needs. So the first thing we're going to talk about is model comprehensive plan language to protect and expand community gardens. So this well can Comprehensive plans, again, are those policy uh, documents to plan a community. So we have a goal to protect existing and establish new community gardens and urban farms as important community resources that build social connections, offer recreation, education, and economic development opportunities, and provide open space and local food source. And we have to the plan uh, implement this all by specific policies and actions, and we list out different actions. And here we have encourage the creation and operation of one community garden for no less than a certain acre for every certain number of households. We have a suggested number, but again, the community is going to tailor this to meet their own needs. And we, we state that the community can identify neighborhoods that don't meet this standard, prioritize the establishment of new gardens in neighborhoods that are underserved by other open space and healthy eating opportunities. And then we have comments. And comments help to explain the basis for the uh, policies or rules and, uh, and some op maybe more options that you have. And our comment here explains how we reach this standard. And then just to let people know who are listening, we suggest some other policies. Identify existing and potential community garden sites, adopt zoning regulations, encourage all new affordable housing units to contain space for gardens, create a community garden within the city, increase support for community gardens through partnerships with other governmental agencies and private institutions, and secure additional community garden sites. Now we're going to talk about uh, NPLAN's zoning code ordinances. And here again is what our tool looks like. And basically what we say is that the community garden should, we define a community garden is as land use for the cultivation of fruits, vegetables, plants, flowers, or herbs by multiple users. We the land needs a water supply, 
and land could be public land. And then we say community gardens are a permitted use in the following types of districts set to certain regulations. And why do we want this? Well, we want this so that it's easier to start a community garden. In Tulsa, Oklahoma, it wanted to start a community garden on land that it had to help uh, low-income residents uh, go for additional food. It turns out that gardens were not specifically addressed in their local code. They were told they had to apply for a special uh, permission, which would cost $1,000. So what happened was they organized themselves and they got their community their city council to pass an ordinance that allowed community gardens as a, an allowed use in certain districts in their city. What that means then is now other people who want to start community gardens in the city can just go ahead and do it. They don't have to apply for special permission and they don't have to pay the cost to apply for special permission. So in designing this this ordinance, some of the things that a community has to look at is what districts are appropriate for community gardens and what type of regulations they want to impose on community gardens. And really, it's a balance of competing needs. We want to encourage accessibility and community engagement. At the same time, a community is going to want to make sure the regulations are sufficient to maintain proper health, safety, and aesthetics. And again, the regulations one size does not fit all. We make suggestions such as requiring operating rules and hours, having a garden coordinator, a fair manner for assigning plots, which is very important. Probably you're going to want to have some limits on the structures and fences that can be built. You may want to have some limits on sales in some communities. They may be fine with allowing gardeners to sell produce that they grow on site in other communities may not to allow the sales on site. And there's some restrictions on the operation of the garden in terms of water drainage. I want to say a quick word about soil testing. Um, here's a, a, just a headline from Montreal. They had to close a couple of their gardens because of some soil contamination. And I think this is the most complicated issue facing communities that want to establish new community gardens. And it is no easy answer. Uh, we suggest having an environmental site assessment, and this is really taking a little history of the property to find out what the prior uses of the property were. If you find out that it was the property was formerly a toxic waste dump, you may not want to establish your garden there. Um, you can also develop a testing protocol, and in some communities, they use raised beds, um, particularly cases where there isn't a, a lot of a history of the property or there's, there's some history of the property having some possible contamination. And this is a picture, actually, of a school in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where a local farm is helping the school to create a community garden. Raised beds aren't the perfect answer. They can sometimes be more expensive than garden on the soil, soil. But for communities that may be encouraging gardening for some older citizens or want disabled uh, persons' participation, they can be uh, very useful. And we have one other brief zoning ordinance, and this is an ordinance that helps preserve existing community gardens. Any many communities, uh, open space, parks, and recreation sites are given special protections as open space districts. And the idea being that every community values their open space and wants to continue having that open space because it's so important to the quality of life for residents. And here what this does is it establishes community garden open space subdistricts which will allow community gardens to have the same rights to preservation as types of open space uh, uses. And this modeled on something that uh, Boston, Massachusetts has. So just to sum up, land use regulations help official, 
establish official policy to promote and preserve community gardens. They make it easier to establish new gardens by removing barriers such as applying for special permission or having to file costly applications. And they preserve existing gardens by giving them the same rights to exist as other forms of open space. I'm wishing everyone gardening. And I'll turn this back to Christine, who will introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Amy. It was a great, great training on our land use policies, which we hope you all will check out on our website. Um, next, we are going to turn to our community examples. And the first is um, Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, and I'm just going to pass control over to Morgan um, before I introduce her. One minute. So um, Morgan Eigert has been a program specialist with the Ohio State University Extension since 2005 and provides training and technical assistance to urban gardens throughout Greater Cleveland. As a co-container of the Cleveland Cuyahoga County Food Policy Coalition, Morgan works in collaboration with diverse stakeholders to inform policies related to urban agriculture and local food systems. She's going to share with you some of her work uh, from Cleveland. To unmute, Morgan. Good afternoon, everyone from Cleveland, Ohio, and um, thank you, Plan, for the opportunity to present some of the different initiatives and policy changes we've been working on here in, in the Cleveland area with regards to community gardening. Um, just to give you some background on our context, the Cleveland context, for where a lot of our work in land use and planning is arising from, is um, our city is a post-industrial city in the Great Lakes region, and so rising amounts of, of vacant property um, in the last few years through the foreclosure process has created an excess of vacant property throughout Cleveland, and we're seeing that also spread into our, our suburbs as well. Um, so community gardens have been a part of Cleveland for some time. Um, this, the photo in this slide goes back to um, the early part of the 20th century in a school gardening program that was implemented district-wide in the city of Cleveland. Based on that, uh, we've had a lot of terrific support uh, from the city over the last several decades to support resources for community gardens. So there's been a long-time relationship of supporting community gardens in Cleveland and also school gardening. The rising amount of vacancy, we've seen a lot of new issues and opportunities arise for community gardening and urban agriculture. We also have a community, because of uh, the population loss and vacancy that has limited access to healthy food, as we've seen a lot of our uh, food retail and grocery stores uh, leave the inner city. So to address some of those barriers, I'm going to talk about three main efforts that we've been undertaking in Cleveland the last three years. Um, one is the Reimagining Cleveland Project. I'm also going to talk about some of the zone changes that we've made to support community gardens as well as some start grants that are available through the city of Cleveland. Just to give a quick snapshot, this is the city of Cleveland, and every red dot on this map represents um, a foreclosure. And this map was done in 2008 by the Urban Design Center, just to give you a sense of the vacancy and potential vacancy we're looking at in Cleveland. This was done by our County Planning Commission, and we were able to map all of the grocery stores greater than 25,000 square feet with our county to get a sense of where we're located and where access to fresh, healthy food was available. Map, we've got, uh, we were able to plot all of the community gardens and urban farms within the city of Cleveland uh, through our partnership with a local planning group. Um, and all of the green circles are a mile radius around each community garden. I'll talk a little bit more about why we use that tool um, to help us target outreach in certain neighborhoods. In terms of the policies, um, with that context of vacancy and foreclosure, um, as well as a long history of community gardening in our, in our different neighborhoods throughout Cleveland, we've got a few different ordinances that we've been working on the last few years. One is an actual zoning category for urban gardens and urban agriculture that's now included in the City of Cleveland's zoning code. We also uh, passed two 
ordinances this year that affect both the health code and the zoning code with regard to keeping farm animals and bees in the city of Cleveland. We've got a uh, grant pram, and then we've got reimagining a more sustainable Cleveland. Just to say a few words about gardening to greenbacks. This was an opportunity for us to work with uh, the Department of Economic Development at the city of Cleveland, which would provide grants for um, urban farmers who want to start up businesses growing food on vacant land in the city of Cleveland. So we were able to, through legislative action, change the language in their microloan program and program to provide those grants for urban farmers. And that program just started at the end of last summer, and we've got several groups that have raised money from the city of Cleveland for capital startup costs for their urban agriculture projects. Starting district zoning, Cleveland had established open space recreation district zoning in 2006, but decided to take it a step further in 2007 and create a category just for urban gardens. In our case, um, gardening is allowed by right and crop production is allowed in all zoning categories in the city of Cleveland. But we have a lot of gardens that are located on land bank lots which are owned by the city. And he holds this land for future development, but allow um, gardens on those sites. But those gardens are not considered the highest and best use of that property. So we created this zoning category to use more as a preservation tool that restricts the use of that property just for um, urban gardening. It also allows for the sale of those products on site and some limited structures such as greenhouses, composting toilets, uh, chicken coops, um, and hoop houses. So restricting the use of that land for urban culture and preventing uh, residential development or commercial development. So we've been able to zone several gardens last year and have another 30 that we're rezoning this year. That code, as it relates to animals and bees, was quite restrictive up until this year. There were hundreds, but setback for all, um, keeping all types of chickens, ducks, bees um, in the city of Cleveland. So we worked for a year with several city departments, including health, building and housing, uh, planning, um, economic development, community development, to look at how we could rewrite the ordinance to allow those uses, because several groups were using. Um, city land and privately owned land for those purposes, and we're having a very, very difficult time navigating the variance process. We were successful um, in that effort, and we passed like a two um, one ordinance that affects both the health and zoning code that allows folks to keep uh, farm animals and bees on their property regardless of uh, the district that they're located in. Um, it removed the setback now to anywhere between 18 inches and 5 feet from the original setback of 100 feet. This code also addresses large animals like potatoes goats, and sheep um, because we have over 3,500 acres of vacant property in Cleveland. We're really looking at urban agriculture as a possibility for microenterprise development. Reaming uh, More Sustainable Cleveland was an effort undertaken by the Urban Design Center and Neighborhood Progress along with several community partners. And this, this uh, strategy on how we can begin looking at how we use our vacant land in the city of Cleveland with a shrinking population and look at ways that we can increase ecosystem services that these vacant properties provide to the community. And within that, we advocated for several different policy recommendations um, went through and passed through city council as well as our city planning commission that kind of took what we were doing to the next level in terms of providing kind of permanent for urban food production. To resident has a community garden within walking distance, a home, which is goes back to that map that was had green circles around each garden, so we can kind of figure out what are the target areas that we need to uh, do more outreach in garden establishment. So we're looking at working on an affordable water policy for urban agriculture. Um, that's a difficult issue in Cleveland right now. It's very restrictive on who can access um, water for urban agriculture projects. So that's another this um, set of recommendations put forward. And we're also kind of reviewing our land bank process to create long-term leases for community gardens. The other thing about this uh, reimagining uh, Cleveland program is we were able to leverage a half a million dollars through neighborhood stabilization program funds, which are partly 
Houston, Cleveland demolition um, and foreclosure. Uh, but we were able to get a section of that that was then available to community groups to develop projects, different types of greening projects, whether it's stormwater um, mitigation or it's um, plant nurseries, but urban agriculture and community garden were a part of that. And grants from ten to $20,000 um, are available to community groups. And we've had over 100 applications of which um, six of them were for community gardens and market gardens. We're working on next, we're working on an overlay district that really looks at more intensive uses um, of agriculture in those multi-acre parcels that we have in the city. We um, are working in partnership with the Cuyahoga County Land Bank, which was just established in the last few months, to deal with uh, vacancy and foreclosure on a countywide basis. Um, and we're looking at some innovative partnerships on how we can look at establishing a program that provides land that comes into the land bank for community gardens and for market gardens. We're working with the County Planning Commission to look at an inventory for urban agriculture to identify public lands that would be a good fit. And then a lot of the recommendations that were passed by the city in the Reimagining Cleveland which included accessibility to urban gardens as well as water policy and long-term land tenure for those projects located on city and county property. So that's a snapshot and uh, I have my contact information here and I'm more than willing to send you any of the ordinances and initiatives that we have worked on here um, to use as, as templates or a starting point for things that you're working on in your own communities. Great. Thank you so much. I think everybody here um, on our end is, is, is ready to move to Cleveland and start gardening. Um, <laughs> there's just such amazing things going on there. So um, I'm going to now take back control of the presentation um, and pass it over to um, Leave Gifford from Oregon, who's going to share with you um, a faith-based model of community gardens. And Leaf is the manager of the Interfaith Food and Farms Partnership, a program of ecumenical ministries of Oregon that seeks to support family farmers and connect low-income people with local food. Since 2005, Leaf has um, brainstormed ideas and raised funds for faith-based projects, including community gardens, community microenterprise incubation kitchens, wellness policies, and partnerships with farmers. Before moving to Oregon, Leave conducted coordinated a bi local campaign on California's central coast. She was raised on a small <laughs> organic farm in northern Maryland where she experienced firsthand the challenges of growing and marketing fruits and vegetables for a living. Leave? Hi, everyone. Thanks for this opportunity to share our experiences from Corvette, Oregon, out at the other OSU which is Oregon State University. Um, Corvallis is a city of 55,000, so we're looking at a very different situation from uh, Cleveland. And, uh, I'm with Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon, which is a nonprofit uh, statewide association of faith groups. We're together on community ministry programs, uh, interreligious dialogue, environmental ministry, and public policy advocacy. Um, we began the Interfaith Food and Farms Partnership in Corvallis in 2005 and expanded programs that sought to link low-income people, farmers, and faith communities um, and with a community food assessment. Uh, let's see if I can advance. There we go. In 2006, we finished a community food assessment that found many things. Um, a residents not making a living wage, um, more than a 15% increase in demand at local food pantries, and looking particularly at the Latino community, a desire for more locally grown food, and very few Latinos represented at community gardens, and of course, low and Latinos suffering disproportionately from related issues. And we came to the conclusion that faith communities have many underused resources that might be key in turning around some of these issues. We secured some funding to work on a number of projects from 2007 to 2010. We're in the middle of that right now. We have begun a community kitchen 
a micro-enterprise development program for people looking to start food-related businesses, um, a wholesale buying club, looking at congregational wellness policies, very similar to the process in 2004 that schools went through in looking at their wellness policies, and a community garden. So we began the process of looking for a garden partner, and we actually put out a request for proposals because we had $20 in hand to support the garden. Um, our purpose was to empower low-income neighbors by growing food on faith community land. And we asked faith communities to, um, if they were interested, to consider that they had the growing conditions and institutional commitment to establish and maintain a garden. How would a garden fit within their mission? How would they recruit low-income participants? And how will their garden serve as a model? These were all elements that were priorities for us in piloting a garden on faith community land. A lot of listeners know are interested in garden budget issues. This does include staff, but typically provide a $4,000 plus or minus stipend to a coordinator every year. And then we have $8,662 spread over the three years to um, establish and maintain the garden. Uh, there are a couple of first-year expenses. The irrigation system cost us $800 to put in, and the shed was $1,000. This is what we had in hand. We also secured some in-kind contributions, which I'll tell you soon. Um, and there are ongoing expenses per year that you can see. Um, and these, these PowerPoints will be available on the web, as far as I understand. So you can look at this later for more detail. The majority of our funding came from the UAA Community Food Projects Grant Program. Uh, we also got funding from the Presbyterian Hunger Program and United Methodist Global Ministries, as well as local fundraising dinners and events. And ultimately chose was Westside Community Church. It's in southwest Corvallis, and it is on a city bus line, which was a priority since we're trying to reach low-income people. Um, wonderful south-facing slope, as you can see, and also was home to an active church member who's a very committed and experienced community garden coordinator. So it's very easy for us to say that we felt Westside Community Church was a reliable partner. We faced a number of tasks that are typical as you get started on a community garden, soil tests, which were addressed earlier, um, fee structures, rules, and an application form. We chose to go with a sliding scale fee structure of 5 to $35. And, and now what we know is that people typically contribute $10. Uh, they are all low income, all of our gardeners, which for us means they are at 200% of poverty or below. Uh, families have contributed $20, but generally it's a $10 contribution. Uh, insurance, we found that Westside Community Church's insurance policy was enough to cover um, bodily damage and property damage to gardeners, visitors, and volunteers. And this was very easy then to deal with. So standard business policy for nonprofits and faith organizations was enough for us. We wrote up a memorandum of understanding establishing the relationship between Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon, which is sort of the funder and um, organism that has a vested interest in what we're learning from this process and, and in the evaluation of it, and, in West, and between Westside Community Church, who is the host of the garden. We drew up a um, hold harmless agreement. I think I have that I, as do no harm, but I meant hold harmless agreement. Um, this is just a clause within our, our list of rules application that says that um, all guards and Westside Community Church shall be held free from any liability for any personal injuries or damage to property resulting from participation in the garden. And we also have a separate power equipment use agreement that is along the same lines. We worked really hard to gather a group of local collaborators and supporters. We had the attention of the mayor and city council, um, several local nonprofits, pantries and soup kitchens, and seven local faith communities that to be involved in different capacities. 
fun. We ending timeline. We had about a month to choose a partner and get the garden going. So we felt very enthusiastic about getting 10 families and have one donation plot for food banks and cooking classes. Our total land use was 10,000 square feet in the first year. That's 2008. So half the garden was the donation plot and half the garden was 10 families. We had 116 volunteers participating. Um, 1,100 pounds of produce were donated to pantries and cooking classes. And on top of our um, funded budget, we also secured $3,400 of in-kind donations, including starts, a tiller, um, a soil amendments, seeds, and those sorts of things. And 32 gardens participation days, which means that um, the, lo the low-income garden families who were actually gardening there came out for work parties and other celebrations to the garden get going. And this is summer of 2008. You can see that it, uh, early in the season, we started in June, so things were – and this is the next year, a little later in the season, um, but we significantly increased the, the side of the garden to 15,000 square feet, and we're now hosting 20 families, um, nine of whom are Latino and one Anglo family. And we have one donation plot that is managed by the St. Mary Catholic Church, who are in what they call a neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor program, where they volunteers grow food for local food banks and cooking classes. So we're in this interface element of different volunteers from faith communities working together in the garden, and we successfully got up to 20 families of gardening participation. Also just this morning was able to get this from 2009. We actually had $4,000 worth of in-kind donations this year. Um, included a lot of fresh produce because we had some garden theft issues and we put the word out on the front page of the local paper that um, that these parking families in their gardens were losing their, their melons at the peak of ripeness. And, and we people actually came from all over and donated produce, put them in bins that we put there next to the garden. And we had just an outpouring of support. So we included that in in-kind donations this year. Um, approximately 3,000 pounds of produce were produced in the 20 family plots. And another 3,200 pounds were donated from the Catholic neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor garden. Uh, this year had 112 volunteers participating. And, um, a couple of wonderful community events, including a tamale-making class and an end-of-the-season carne asada dinner with uh, the mayor in attendance, which was which was a nice thing. Things the garden successful. Um, I think that our links with the Latino community were a key to success. There was one man in particular who's a very avid gardener from Mexico, and he um, was really enthusiastic to hear that we're starting a new garden and basically told the members of his congregation, which is the Iglesia Cuadrangular, and out came these 20 families, so we, or 19. Um, this was a wonderful collaboration. The host congregation was very supportive of having the garden located there and offered their kitchen for things like the tamale making class and a green salsa class. Um, clear vision, I think, and very well defined, and good links with other programs in the community. And I want to share a couple of stories that demonstrate the gardener's situation. One gardener has a husband with leukemia, and she was told by doctors not to offer him fresh vegetables uncooked from the garden because of a weakened immune system. So she turned tanning all of her produce from the garden and is very proud that now they're able to, for the rest of the year, um, what she produced in her 400-square-foot plot. Another woman said that having her garden made her realize that she needed a freezer, and she filled her freezer from her garden. This year, when her fellow gardeners were complaining about having too many tomatoes and other things, she suggested that they also get freezers. 
telling them that they're eat, be eating from their garden all year. And she said that 10 of the 20 families actually went out and bought freezers. So this is considerable when you think about how low income many of these families are. Some of them have zero income. And to secure a used freezer um, or new is a, is a large commitment. Some of the challenges, um, collecting information from gardeners who would really rather have documentation about who they are or what they're doing, um, being sensitive to that. Volunteer participation throughout the season, I think we're doing really well with that, but it's always a case of volunteers expressing great enthusiasm in the beginning and then um, leaving on vacation. As I mentioned, but this also raised a lot of awareness about the garden and brought an outpouring of community support. And deer, we did not invest in a fence so far for this garden, and we're, we're doing fine with that, but it is something to consider. Another, I learned a lot about gaining low-income participation in programs, all of them, including Community Kitchen, Microenterprise Development, Buying Club, and Garden. Um, we, we work hard to understand the causes and consequences of poverty and work with rather than on behalf um, the, of the community that we're, we are going to collaborate with. Um, thinking of practical issues such as public transportation, scale fees and translation of materials, um, addressing the needs of people with disabilities, and talking with people. I just want to mention that we've published a handbook this year called Food Sovereignty for All, um, for hauling the food system with faith-based initiatives, and it's available at the Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon website, and it details the projects that we've been working on and some of the things that we've learned from that. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for sharing the, the stories of the gardeners in, up in Oregon. So I'm just going to transition over, we have um, one last very brief presentation um, here from Enman, um, just about a few other resources that are available through us that might be of use to your community um, related to, in particular, nutrition policy. So um, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Stephanie Stevens, who is a staff attorney here with Enplant. Okay, well, good morning, afternoon, good day to everybody. I'm just going to give a um, review of some of our lead technical assistance that we have available here at Implan. So just go ahead and get started. So I know that most of you have seen a landscape that looks like this. It's not very inviting for walking or cycling. You've got tons of fast food restaurants, a liquor store. It doesn't look like a very healthy uh, community. And our goal here at Implan is to support the childhood obesity prevention movement by helping to make communities healthier through law, law and policy. And um, we do that by providing legal technical assistance in three basic ways. The first way that we do that through legal research. And we conduct legal research in-house. We also um, contract with experts in the field to provide the legal research that supports the childhood obesity prevention policies um, that we also develop. That would be the second form of technical assistance that um, we conduct here at Implan. We um, have a number of model policies which include um, local ordinances, local resolutions, state resolutions, state laws, model contracts, um, all aimed at um, the childhood obesity epidemic um, and real about making communities healthier. All um, available on our website. A third form of technical assistance that we offer um, is basically taking place right now, which are webinars, trainings. We do one-on-one um, -on -one technical assistance. We also present at a number of conferences um, throughout the year around the country. Now I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, some more specific examples of the policies that we have available. And I'm going to start with a few that are related to 
to food systems. And the first one I want to mention is our farmer's market tools. Um, you've already heard all about our community gardens tools. The farm market, our farmer's market tools um, are model plan policies that help you to establish and sustain farmers markets as an approved use for land. And this is a great way to increase access to healthy foods, especially in underserved um, areas that may have a bricks and mortar supermarket where people can easily buy fresh produce. And of our um, policies here at Implan that we've developed is a healthy school food zone ordinance. And this restricts any new fast food restaurants from locating within close proximities to, to schools. Um, this restriction aims to make the food environment near schools healthier, and it's also a way to support the school lunch program. And all of our work around food systems are our healthy mobile vending tools, and these are tools to help communities implement healthy mobile vending policies. Right now we have a fact sheet on our website as well as a chart of mobile vending policies as they exist in the 10 most populous cities in the U.S. And coming very soon we have a model produce cart ordinance. It creates a special permit and um, incentives for vendors of whole uncut produce, much like the New York City Green Cart program. So very soon on our website. On the other side of the energy equation, we have tools that are aimed at uh, promoting physical activity in communities. We have a whole suite of Complete Street products that will be available very soon. Um, Complete Streets allow people to safely get around on foot, on bicycle, or via public transportation. We're going to be having a local and state resolution, a local and state law, and also model comprehensive plan language very soon that will be available on our website. We all have a whole suite of products related to joint use agreements and actually several model agreements on our website. Joint use agreements um, open school facilities to the community for recreational use during school hours and allow school district to share the cost and responsibility for doing so with local government. This is another great way to increase opportunities for physical activity in your community. We have a whole host of other model policies um, available on our website. We have child care, physical activity standards, um, school district advertising policies. We have a model menu labeling ordinance and new products that, are, that we're constantly adding to our website. Our web address is there in the um, right-hand corner, www.implanonline.org. And our website, this is what it will look like. So we hope that you'll take a look at our site um, and just sort of browse around and see what we have available. Um, if you happen to download any of our tools, um, use them, we'd love to know how you use them, if you have any feedback for us about other tools that we might create. Um, we like to say that all of our documents are really living documents. So as we get back from folks in the field that are actually using our tools, um, and as we learn more about best practices, we're always you know, revising and, and changing um, our tools so that they meet needs. So we'd love to hear from you if you have any feedback for us. Includes um, my presentation on Implan. There's my contact information, and also again our website, implanonline.org. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you, Stephanie. So now we will um, turn to questions from all of you, um, and just a few of the easy questions, administrative questions that have been coming in. Um, a lot of people are asking about slides. We will be posting PDFs of the slides on our website. In a, we really get those up within about a week of the webinar. And um, 
since you've all registered for the webinar, uh, we'll send out an email um, when materials are available to all of you, so, you'll, you'll, so that you'll know. Uh, we also um, do an evaluation of our webinars, so along with a link to the resources, we'll send you a link to our evaluation, and we really hope that you'll give us feedback on how we can make this training and future ones um, better uh, to serve your needs. So um, please use the Q panel to submit questions. We have about 10 minutes to answer your questions, and you can submit them for any of the panelists, um, whether it be Amy or Leave or Morgan. Um, we, can, we can take the questions. So the first question um, is, where does an acre for every 2,500 households standard come from? Hi, this is Amy. Um, one thing I want to note generally is in all of our policies, um, we have uh, comments which explain all the information in it, and we do have a comment on that policy. Uh, it's basically, um, that's the standard that CL Washington uses, and we believe it's adopted from the standard that the National Parks and Recreation Association puts out for the recommended um, number of tall lots or small playgrounds per community. And community gardens are often similar in size to a small playground. So we used that comparison. I also want to make a plug for when you look at our policies to um, actually look at the footnotes, even though I know footnotes are boring sometimes, and they do have citations, but we also include in there our some background information to help people when implementing policies. So we have references on um, good model community garden rules and some publications on how to start a community garden. So you may find some additional information there on topics related to community gardens that are not covered particularly in the tool. The next question I'm going to send to uh, Leave and Morgan, so unmute you guys, and that is, um, have you tried um, including a help yourself plot to reduce garden theft? So I'm just going to throw this out to you guys to uh, see if you have any other strategies for uh, addressing garden theft. in Oregon, we have actually at, at community garden locally tried having a community table where people can put excess produce. And that's very helpful, and it cuts down on the theft for sure, and we need to do that at Westside Community Garden. Um, however, the theft we experienced this year was on a different scale. It was um, people with large boxes and, grocer and uh, garbage bags and just scoring the whole garden and filling their bags um, with produce. So we we need to have some land and some signage up about what a community garden really is. I think Amy has a comment as well. Yes, um, one of the things that you can do um, when developing your comprehensive plan policy language around gardens is one of the things the government can do is, is require the police to work cooperatively, cooperatively with community gardens. And, and once these community gardens have uh, a more official status and the policy is there, um, it can be also the policy that uh, the police departments include uh, surveilling gardens as part of their regular police work. And knowing that the police are supervising can also be a deterrent to some types of theft or vandalism or other problems with gardens. Our next question is, do you have any examples of a smart code or form-based code zoning ordinance that specifically incorporates regulations for community gardens? And to take that question first, um, we are fortunate to be joined by one of our in-house experts, Heather Wooten. Uh, for an answer. Hey everybody, it's great to be here and I really enjoyed the presentation today. I'm a colleague here at Public Health Law and Policy, which is the parent nonprofit of NPLAN. 
Um, so this question was asked by somebody who's clearly pretty savvy about the way that planning processes work, and the rest of you out there who, who not be as familiar with the concepts of smart codes or form-based codes, the idea that Amy presented earlier, which showed a map of a zoning ordinance, and she described how each section of a community um, is divided and different uses are allowed within each of those districts, um, the idea of a form-based code really turns that, that concept around, and it's, uh, a, a, con it's a, a new tool that communities are using because they found that the old use-based codes don't do a great job of ensuring that we have vibrant, mixed-use uh, communities where people can access their daily needs within walking distance of their home. And the idea of a form-based code is that you don't say what use can take place. You say what the uh, building or structure or, or streetscape has to look like. So the difference there is, is again, that the uses are not defined, but the, the form of the urban environment is, in fact, very specifically described. And, and these are often made of a lot of pictures of <laughs> here's what the street is supposed to look like, here is what a neighborhood makes use. Uh, commercial building is supposed to look like it has this many windows, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we address this a little bit in the, um, in the model, and I encourage everybody to take a look at that. Um, the, the basic idea here for a form code or a form-based code is that the form of a community garden needs to be described and defined in the code. It, you know, whether you're talking about a use base or form base, the idea is to reference community gardens and have them allowed within that. And I, I point you to one interesting resource, which is uh, a sustainability smart code from Rocky Mountain Land Use Institute. It's free. Uh, that's out of uh, University of Denver. And they talk about community gardens as part of um, form-based codes. And I believe that if you read uh, the smart code, if you Google smart code, it's a thing that will come up with a free document. Um, they also reference urban agriculture, but, but the, the basic concept here is to ensure that whatever type of local regulation you have, it actually references gardens and that uh, the diversity of gardens we've all seen here today could be possible within that code. Thank you, Heather. Um, so our next question is if, if anyone knows of programs that are specifically tied into hospital systems, either as an education outreach for the hospital or as a research vehicle for public health. Um, and I, I know that Cleveland has a pretty, really strong hospital system. Morgan, is, is, are there any linkages with community gardens to hospitals there? Um, so a couple things. We um, are the home of the Cleveland Clinic, which many folks may be familiar with. And they have um, been pursuing an active interest the last year in incorporating a lot of local food purchasing um, for their food service. They also um, started a farmer's market on the main campus of the Cleveland Clinic. And the other thing that they are also looking at is how they can utilize some of the vacant property that they have in a holding strategy for future development down the road and offer that to the community for use as community garden space. So they're looking at a couple different ways that they can leverage um, their resources and uh, stature within the community to support uh, local food efforts. This is Amy, and um, I, I, it's not community gardens, but the Kaiser hospitals have an initiative on farmers markets, and they uh, they have hospitals in uh, mostly in the western United States, California, Hawaii, or in Washington, I believe a few other states, and they uh, hold farmers markets at their hospitals, which used um, for uh, employees. Uh, Pants, uh, visitors, and so forth. So you want to look into uh, at, at the Kaiser Hospitals programs and see they they may be also working towards some other um, uh, related policies, including community gardens. Right. Um, we're just about nearing the end of our session, and so just as a final closing comment. Um, Again, we'll find a veritable cornucopia of resources and slides on our website in about a week, and you'll get an email about that. Um, we do are tr doing webinars about every other month 
on different topics, um, not just related to nutrition, but also physical activity. And we're planning one um, for in December on complete streets. So if you um, gave us your contact information for this webinar and said that we could contact you in the future, uh, you will be getting notification when we've uh, set a date and when registration opens for that. So an eye out for that. Um, thank you so much for joining us, and happy gardening. Okay, what's that?